Uh, I'd first of all like to thank Labon IBSC for inviting me to speak at this very exciting event. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, very good to see so many faces here today. Uh, what I'll be talking about today is uh, how, as we go forward, uh, there's going to be a lot more transparency requirements in international tax structures. Two words you're going to hear a lot today are substance and transparency. And these two words are really inextricably interlinked. Uh, governments and tax authorities are going to expect a lot more commercial substance in international tax structures, failing which they may deny certain tax benefits within the structures. They are also going to require a lot more information about these tax structures to see whether that level of substance they require is truly there or not. Uh, at the same time, with these increased levels of transparency, it's going to become very, very easy for a tax authority anywhere in the world to see up front whether or not the substance is there. Uh, and in some cases, as you'll hear later, they'll actually even be able to put a stop to a tax planning strategy or a tax planning scheme before it's even implemented because of the nature of the transparency requirements that are going to come into play. Um, transparency is really nothing new in the international tax world. Uh, the UK, for example, has had a regime known as the Disclosure of Tax Avoidance Schemes since 2004. Uh, so in the UK since 2004, if a company or a group is putting into place a tax planning strategy, they're meant to go up front and declare it to the UK tax authorities, uh, even at the time that they put it into place. Uh, and at the time this, uh, this, this, this scheme was introduced by the UK tax authorities, it was actually termed to be a scheme of non-judgmental transparency, meaning when you disclose it to the tax authorities, they're not meant to judge you, they're not meant to say, oh, you're doing something wrong, they're just meant to take the information on board and process it and really understand what you're trying to do. Uh, and while there's certainly been a lot of transparency due to this scheme, whether, whether or not it's non-judgmental perhaps is, is open to debate. Uh, so that's the UK. Uh, the United States, uh, since the global financial crisis in 2010, uh, they required what uh, is known as the uncertain tax position form to be filled out, the Form 1120. So in the US, if you're doing something which perhaps the tax law is not entirely clear on, you're meant to disclose that together with your tax return up front to the tax authorities. So it's not their responsibility to find out that you're doing something that's not clear in law. You're meant to tell them up front, and that's been in place since 2010. Countries like Australia since 2011, 2012 have also uh, required certain degrees of transparency. Um, and, you know, it's not just uh, countries which are putting in place transparency requirements. Even within countries, we're finding that authorities are a lot more transparent. So immigration is talking to the tax authorities now to say, look, uh, you know, we, we found this person leaving the country when he's got a tax bill. Uh, customs is talking to the tax authority to see whether or not the information that's shared for importation purposes is the same information that's shared for income tax purposes. Uh, in Malaysia, for example, where I come from, uh, there's been a new directive from the authorities where if you haven't paid your tax, they'll actually stop you from leaving the country because information has been shared with the immigration authorities. And there's a very handy website you can check to see whether or not you're on this blacklist. So for me, before I travel, uh, I can actually check this website. And so then I know whether to tell the cab driver to take me to the airport or to take me to the tax authorities to pay my tax. Right? So there has been a lot more transparency, but a lot of the transparency has been very um, siloed. So it's always been different jurisdictions asking for different things. Uh, they may have different objectives in their transparency requirements. What we are going to talk about a lot today is the OECD's BEPS initiative, uh, which is really going to be a game changer in terms of transparency uh, and in terms of substance requirements worldwide. So what, what is BEPS? Uh, and some of you may have heard this term a lot. Uh, Daniel brought it up in his opening. Uh, BEPS stands for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting. So if we break down that term, base erosion is basically the erosion of the tax base, so the erosion of revenue. You don't park revenue in the right countries, and therefore you erode the income that is subject to tax. Profit shifting, on the other hand, is really perhaps putting in place expenses which will shift profits from potentially high tax jurisdictions to perhaps low tax jurisdictions, perhaps by making royalty payments, interest payments, license payments. So how did this whole initiative come about? Um, you know, as we know, today the world is a lot more global. Companies do business in many, many jurisdictions. Uh, and they're no longer focused on only one or two jurisdictions. There, there are various reasons for that. Uh, the formation of economic blocks, for example. So we've got the NAFTA in North America. We've got the EU. 
closer to home, we've got the ASEAN economic community. And with all these trading blocks, it makes it a lot easier because traders' trades barriers are really brought down and it's easy to work across countries. Um, it's also, uh, in today's world, a lot more competitive. So companies need to go beyond their borders if they want to realize a fair amount of profits or a decent amount of profit. And perhaps the main reason for cross-border trade is really technology. You know, e-commerce is now prevalent. Uh, I can sit in Hong Kong today and run a business throughout Asia. I can sit in Hong Kong today and sell goods throughout the world without actually leaving my office or my home. Uh, so because of this, there's been a lot more complexity in international structuring for, for tax purposes and for business purposes. Uh, and after the global financial crisis, uh, there was a lot of media attention, especially in the UK and the US, about the tax behavior uh, and the per perceived uh, bad tax behavior of certain large multinationals. Uh, and a lot of these multinationals were in the tech industry, but also a whole bunch of other industries, including food and beverage. Uh, and because of the media scrutiny, uh, not only was there you know, reputational concerns for these companies, you know, customers were saying, look, we have to boycott this company because they're not paying enough tax, uh, but it also caught the attention of governments. And a lot of these companies were required to be present before government uh, organizations, before government committees, to explain themselves and to explain why they had structured their businesses in a particular way. Because of all this attention, uh, the G20 actually decided that they needed to do something about it. So uh, in June 2012, the G20 had a meeting in Los Cabos in Mexico, uh, and they said, look, we, we've really got to see whether or not the tax uh, schemes or the, the way the tax uh, world works is fair. So they went to the OECD and said, look, uh, OECD, can you please have a look at this? Uh, and the OECD looked at it, and the OECD felt that, well, while everything that was being done was perfectly legal, so there were a lot of tax benefits out there, and companies were just taking advantage of those, uh, the legality did not necessarily result in the tax being paid in the right places. So the OECD felt that there was a disconnect between where value was being generated and where tax was being paid. Uh, and there was a couple of reasons for that. So one reason was really uh, the use of tax treaties or, or double taxation agreements. Tax treaties were really brought about to uh, avoid double taxation of income. So if Malaysia has a treaty with Hong Kong, or Hong Kong has a treaty with the Netherlands. The purpose of the tax treaty between these countries is to really make sure the same income is not taxed twice. But because of the increased complexity and the increased sophistication uh, of tax planning, uh, the OECD found that these tax treaties actually resulted in double non-taxation of income. So instead of resulting in income not being taxed twice, it was in fact not being taxed at all. Uh, and the other reason that uh, there was a disconnect uh, in, in where taxes was being paid is because of companies taking advantages or taking advantage of the difference in tax regimes between jurisdictions. So uh, if I make a payment from country A to country B, I may be able to get a deduction in country A, but country B may not tax that income. So because of that, uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was a feeling at the OECD that tax was not being paid in the right jurisdictions. And one of the main reasons was lack of transparency. If me in country A, I'm giving you a tax deduction for an expense, Maybe I'll be a lot more vigilant about giving you that deduction if I know that the income is not going to be taxed in country B. Or if I know that when I, you pay the income to country B, you've got a special tax incentive, for example, in country B. So with that, the OECD came up with what they call their BEPS action plan, uh, or their base erosion and profit shifting action plan. Uh, and there are 15 action items on the action plan, as you can see here. We won't be talking about all those today because you know, they're, they're fairly complex and that might take all day. We will focus on uh, perhaps a few of these, uh, item 5 over there and item 12 and 13. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about item 6 uh, and perhaps item 15. Um, and incidentally, in coming up with this action plan, the OECD did some research. Uh, and according to the OECD, uh, they feel that because of base erosion and profit shifting or because of BAPS, uh, they, they feel that there's actually been an underpayment of global taxes uh, of between 4 and 10% of global corporate profits. Uh, so they feel that uh, the, the tax leakage is actually something to the effect of 100 to 240 million, billion rather, US dollars every year because of tax planning. So let, let's consider some of these things that the OECD is proposing, which will lead to greater transparency. Um, the, the first thing I'll talk about is uh, this Action 5, which is uh, labeled Countering Harmful Tax Practices. So what is a harmful tax practice? 
uh, if you read the OECD's publications and literature on this matter, uh, they actually talk about a harmful tax practice as being really an incentive scheme uh, or a special concession, whereby you don't pay tax because the government has given you something special. Uh, and they've broken up their harmful tax practices publication into two aspects. One is really saying that really if you want to get a tax incentive or if a country wants to give a tax incentive, they must require substantial activity or substance. So you cannot give away a tax holiday for nothing anymore. Uh, and on top of that, the OECD is saying there must be improved transparency. So not only must there be substance, you must let the rest of the world know who has got incentives in your country. So in terms of substantial activity, um, the OECD has actually focused a lot on IP regimes. So they focused on IP regimes because a lot of the perceived tax abuses were really to do with IP. A lot of countries were parking intellectual property in places like you know, Luxembourg, places like the Netherlands, where they got very good uh, or low tax rates on this income, which was earned from the IP. Uh, but at the same time, there was a perceived lack of substance. So the OECD has now come up with a, a lot of literature on what they feel a country needs to demand before they give an IP-based incentive. Uh, and the OECD has come up with what they call the nexus approach. So in summary, the nexus approach basically says that if you want to park your IP in, say, for example, Luxembourg, and you want to get a tax incentive there, you can't simply buy the IP and park it there and have no people there and not do anything there. Rather, you need to develop the IP there yourself in that country, and you need to maintain the IP there in that country. So there must be legitimate and sufficient business activity there in relation to the generation and maintenance of the IP in order for that country to actually give you a tax incentive. So while they are focused on IP, they also cover a whole range of other uh, sort of arrangements. So they talk about headquarters incentives, they talk about distribution center incentives, shipping, banking and insurance, fund management, uh, and, and they give examples on what is sufficient substance. So for example, for headquarters regimes, you need people, you need the ability to make decisions, you need to be able to bear costs on behalf of the companies you are serving. Uh, for shipping, you need to do fleet management, you need to do crew management. So it basically, the OECD is saying that if you, a country wants to give an incentive, it can no longer be an incentive for nothing. It must be based on the substance in that country. So that's the substantial activity bit of the literature. Uh, and the OECD is also saying that if you are what they call a harmful regime, meaning you don't have substance in your country, but you are still giving away incentives, countries are meant to phase out these incentives. So they are not allowed to allow anybody new to claim this incentive after 30th June 2016. And for the people who are already claiming the incentives, they're, they're what they call grandfathering provisions, meaning they should phase out the incentives for the persons who don't have substance. Uh, and interestingly, the OECD said that in doing their work, they actually reviewed 16 different incentive regimes. So they looked at countries like China, France, Spain, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and they found that every single one of those countries did not have sufficient substance requirements for their incentives. So the OECD is saying that all the incentive regimes out there, for IP at least, are really, in their minds, not, work, not, not really up to scratch. Uh, in addition to requiring countries to have substance, uh, the OECD is also requiring increased transparency. So they are saying now that countries must exchange information on rulings. In other words, if I, uh, in say Malaysia, um, know that my company is trading with Hong Kong, and I have given an incentive to that company in Malaysia, me, the Malaysian tax authorities, must share with the Hong Kong tax authorities that, hey, this company in Malaysia has an incentive. They're not paying any tax because we've given them a tax holiday, for example. Uh, and it's not only current incentives that they're proposing to share. Uh, the OECD is saying that countries should share incentives that were introduced after 1st January 2010, as long as those incentives were around from 1st January 2014. So, for example, if a company got an incentive on 1st January 2010, and that incentive lasted until after 1st January 2014, when these disclosure requirements come about, and the disclosure requirements come about this year, all these incentive regimes must be disclosed. So wh what basically this means is that going forward, it's going to be more difficult to get incentives until and unless you can prove 
you're going to commit substantial activity to enjoy that incentive. And also because of the transparency, countries are going to be a lot more aware of what companies are doing on a global basis. So right now, if I'm the tax authority in Hong Kong, and a Hong Kong entity is paying a billion dollars in royalty to Switzerland, I wouldn't really know what is going on in Switzerland. I'll just say, okay, in Hong Kong, it looks like it's fine, it's deductible, I'll give them a tax deduction. But in the future, if you know that this company has got an incentive in Switzerland and they're not paying any tax in Switzerland, perhaps you'll be a bit more vigilant. You'll say, hmm, is a billion dollars really the right figure? Are they only paying a billion dollars because they know they're not going to pay tax in the other country? So this is uh, going to certainly increase a lot more uh, scrutiny um, on the parts of the tax authorities. Uh, the next uh, action I'll talk about is uh, preventing treaty abuse. So as I, I said earlier, one of the perceived imperfections in the global tax world is really that tax treaties are being used to result in double non-taxation of income. Uh, and in today's world, if I want to enjoy a tax treaty, let's just say I'm a Hong Kong company and um, I basically am making a loan to, let's just say, a Malaysian company. If I want to enjoy the tax treaty between Malaysia and Hong Kong, all I really need to prove is that I'm a resident of Hong Kong. So I get the Hong Kong tax authorities to give me a letter saying I'm a resident in Hong Kong for tax purposes. Uh, and I just have to prove that I'm the beneficial owner of that income. So if I give a loan, the interest comes back to me in Hong Kong. That is my money. I'm not just an agent collecting it for someone else. Uh, and generally, if I can prove those two conditions, I should get the benefits of the tax treaty. In this case, I'll get a reduced withholding tax rate when Malaysia pays Hong Kong. Going forward, uh, they're proposing a, a whole number of things, and I'll focus on number one, what they call anti-treaty shopping provisions. Uh, and under these anti-treaty pro shopping provisions, the OECD is proposing that in addition to meeting the beneficial ownership test and the residence test, which I mentioned earlier, uh, companies will also need to meet what they call either the principal purpose test or the limitation of benefits rule. What are these? Let me talk about this a little bit more. The principal purpose test. So the principal purpose test, according to the OECD, is, and, and I'll quote, they, they basically say that a benefit under this convention, meaning the tax treaty, shall not, be regard, shall not be granted in respect of an item of income or capital if it's reasonable to conclude that obtaining the benefit was one of the principal purposes of the arrangement. In other words, if you put in place a scheme or a structure and one of the principal reasons you put that into place was in order to enjoy a tax treaty, you shouldn't enjoy the tax treaty. That's what the OECD is saying. And, and interestingly, they have the words reasonable to conclude. Uh, so what's reasonable to you may not be reasonable to me. What's reasonable to us may not be reasonable to the tax authority. So there is a lot of uh, perhaps leeway for the tax authorities to interpret this. Uh, and very interestingly, it does not need to be the sole or dominant purpose of what you're doing. So it's not the only reason that you're doing this transaction uh, to get advantage of the tax treaty, but as long as it's one of the principal reasons that you're doing it, you should be denied a benefit under the tax treaty. So what this means is that there's going to be a lot more onus on companies to be transparent over why they have put in place a certain arrangement. Uh, and also they're going to have to think a, a lot more about the commercial reasons why they're doing something uh, and not just the tax reasons. Because the OECD has said that if the structure is inextricably linked to a commercial activity um, and generally this commercial benefit overrides the tax benefit, then it's unlikely that they will challenge it. So a lot more transparency, a lot more work needs to be done to prove why you are putting in place a tax structure. So in addition to the principal purpose test, they are also proposing what they call the limitation of benefits rule. Limitation of benefits is really a, a US concept. So all of the US tax treaties actually has, in addition to beneficial ownership, in addition to residency, they have a condition that a certain test or a certain series of tests need to be met. And they call that the limitation of benefits test. So basically under this limitation of benefits test, you need to prove, let's just say for example, you're setting up a holding company to invest into the US. You must prove several things. You must prove that the holding company has substance, so it has some sort of business operation. Two, you must prove that there is some sort of interrelation between the holding company and its operations. 
and the U.S. investee company and its operations. Uh, and you must prove that the holding company really has what they call substantial operations, meaning it cannot just have $100 of income a year. It must have something substantial. And what is substantial is really subject to debate depending on the structure. So I, I won't go into a lot of the details, but basically uh, suffice to note that in the future, it's going to be perhaps a bit more difficult to take advantage of tax treaties because the OECD is proposing that this limitation of benefits rule actually be included in a lot of tax treaties or all tax treaties. Uh, and the OECD hasn't actually come up with specific language for this rule yet because the US is actually currently revising their own internal limitation of benefits rules. And the OECD wants to see what the US comes up with before the OECD proposes language. Uh, and that's going to be pretty interesting because the US is probably going to come up with fairly strong language. Uh, and the US is, of course, a very sophisticated tax jurisdiction. So if the OECD mirrors the US, uh, you can just imagine that it would be a little bit difficult, perhaps, to take advantage of the tax treaty in the future unless you really have a lot of substance and unless you're willing to be very transparent about the substance that you have. Disclosure requirements. So now, you know, we've talked about how IP regimes and a lot of tax regimes now need more substance before you get an incentive. We've talked about tax treaties. Uh, this is probably, in addition to the next thing I'm going to talk about, this is probably the main driver for transparency in the OECD's uh, BAPS action plans. So what the OECD is now proposing is that if a company or a group of companies is engaging in what they call aggressive tax planning, uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about what that is, they are meant to disclose it up front to the tax authorities. Right? And interestingly, when the OECD talked about this, uh, they said that, look, it's not just the company that has to disclose. Uh, the OECD is saying that there is actually a choice. Each country can decide who they want to disclose. It can either be the taxpayer and the promoter of the scheme, and the promoter of the scheme can be anybody who designs and markets and promotes this scheme. So, for example, if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I've got this fantastic tax planning idea. If you do this, you put this company there, you put that company there, you put that company there, you won't pay any tax. Uh, and please put this into place. These people are promoters of the scheme. So the OECD is saying that countries should put the onus not only on the taxpayers, but also on the promoters of the scheme to come forward and tell the tax authorities. Say, for example, you're doing this in the UK. You've got to go to the UK tax authorities and say, hey, Mr. Tax Authority, I'm actually promoting this scheme and it may be aggressive tax planning. So countries have the choice of either requiring the promoter only to disclose, or both the promoter and the taxpayer. But if the promoter is in another country, or if the promoter has legal privilege, perhaps they are a legal firm, they're not required to disclose by law, or if there is no promoter, then the taxpayer is required to disclose. And the promoter actually needs to disclose at the time they make the scheme available. So basically, if today I'm going to go out there and market something, Today, I have to go to the tax authorities and say, hello, this is what I'm going to be telling people to do. If it's the taxpayer, they have to do it at the point of implementing the scheme. So very interestingly, this is not just disclosure about a past event. It is you having to be transparent about something you may put into place in the future. So if you can just think about it, from the tax authorities' perspective, they can actually stop you even before you put into place a structure or a scheme because they already have information about it. Uh, and if you don't disclose, then there could be severe penalties in the event of an audit. So then the next question is, what is aggressive tax planning? Uh, and the OECD has said that, look, that is on a country-by-country -country basis. Each country should decide what is aggressive tax planning, but they've given some examples. So, for example, if a scheme is put into place where you are doing a transaction with a low tax jurisdiction, that may be aggressive tax planning. Uh, if you're putting into place a scheme that is structured really to allow you to use existing tax losses in an accelerated way, that may be aggressive tax planning. Uh, and the OECD says maybe some countries will even have blacklists of transactions, of certain complex transactions, which will always require disclosure. For example, complex leasing transactions may require disclosure. The OECD is also saying that depending on what the principal or, or the promoter is doing. So if the promoter has certain characteristics around the scheme uh, that may lead to the scheme being seen to be aggressive, you need to disclose. One example is where the promoter is getting paid based on a contingent fee. So the promoter is then pushing something because he's being paid based on the amount of tax savings that you get. Then that may be tax planning that needs to be disclosed. 
uh, if the promoter is relying on the confidentiality of the scheme to ensure that it's successful, so the promoter is saying, look, you can't disclose this to anybody, just do it, that may also be tax planning which you need to disclose. So this is going to be very interesting because it actually forces companies to go up front. And it's not just the companies or the taxpayers who have the owners to disclose, it's also the promoters. Next, uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is on transfer pricing. So all of you here would, would know what transfer pricing is all about. In, in every country now, transfer pricing is probably one of the hottest, if not the hottest, topics on the radar of the tax authorities. And, and right now, when you do transfer pricing documentation, let's just say you are a Hong Kong-based company or a Singapore-based company, uh, and you actually have a, a group of companies around you in other countries with which you transact. Uh, let's just say you are a trading company. Uh, and you're based in Singapore, and you deal with your foreign-related companies, which are in Australia, the US, the UK, right now you'll prepare transfer pricing documentation to defend the margins you're earning in Singapore. So the tax authorities come back to you and say, well, look, this is my transfer pricing documentation. I, I buy and sell from related parties. I'm actually making a 10% profit margin. That's actually quite good. The tax authorities look at it and say, yeah, yeah that's quite good. 10% is quite good because everybody else is only making 8% or 7%, or maybe everybody else is making 10%. So you're okay. But what the OECD is proposing is perhaps a quantum shift in how you do transfer pricing. The OECD is proposing that you have a, a local file, which is exactly what I talked about earlier, a file in the country you operate, which explains that particular company's or that particular taxpayer's profile. But they also want you to prepare what they call a master file. And that master file sets out details uh, on the group's business, the group's transfer pricing policies, and the relationships between the companies in a group from a commercial perspective. Uh, and both the local file and the master file need to be submitted to the tax authorities. Then they are also proposing a, a third item called the country-by-country country report. Uh, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail shortly. So you've got your local file, you've got your master file which talks about the organizational structure, talks about the business overall of the group, talks about where the intangibles are parked, it talks about financing, it talks about the overall tax position of the group. That information really flows into a local file. So the tax authorities will now have information on the local company and they'll see the global footprint. And now they also want you to report what they call country by country reporting. Country by country reporting is basically where you fill in this template and give it to the tax authorities. Who has to fill this in? Any multinational group with global turnover in excess of 750, million, 750 million billion euros will need to fill this in. 750 million euros is not, not a lot uh, for many multinational groups. So if you have got more than 750 million euros, you need to fill this in and submit it to your tax authority. Your tax authority will then share it with all the other tax authorities in which your group has a footprint. So, for example, if you are a Hong Kong-based multinational, you do business in 20 companies worldwide, you meet the threshold, you're meant to fill in this table on an annual basis, give it to the Hong Kong tax authorities. The Hong Kong tax authorities will see, okay, you do business in these 20 countries, and they will share it with those 20 countries, as long as these other 20 countries are also on the list of sharing jurisdictions. So these other countries also have laws and requirements to share. So if another country won't share with Hong Kong, Hong Kong probably won't share with that country. But if they have reciprocal arrangements in place, this information will be shared. So if you look at the sort of information they require, they require the jurisdiction in which you do business, uh, your revenues, unrelated parties, related parties, profit loss before tax, income tax paid, income tax accrued. They want a lot of information. And you can just imagine the tax authorities in Hong Kong sitting there and looking, okay, you're paying a decent amount of tax in Hong Kong, but here you've got BVI. Uh, BVI has got no employees. BVI has got no assets. But for some reason, you've got a billion dollars of income in the BVI, and you've got no tax paid in the BVI. So where's that income coming from? Why is that income not captured in Hong Kong? Why is it going to a jurisdiction where you've got no employees, no substance, and why are you capturing the profits there? So this will result in the ability of a country or a country's tax authorities to very quickly look at this report and say, well, yeah, what they're reporting in my country looks okay, but interestingly, a lot of the profits are in other jurisdictions. 
And uh, if this company is really based in my jurisdiction, why do they have huge profits in all these low-tax countries? Um, so this needs to be reported uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, OECD is proposing that uh, you start reporting for the financial year 2016, and the first report needs to be prepared within 12 months of the end of the financial year 2016. So potentially, uh, you will need to actually report by the end of 2017, if you have a December year end. So 1st January to 31st December 2016 is your financial year. You need to report by end 2017. Um, but not all countries have this in place yet. Some countries have already introduced this and some countries have not. Uh, it's expected that a lot of countries will start introducing it over the next few months. And one major reason that a country may introduce this is because this CBCR, or country-by-country country reporting, has an inbuilt mechanism called the secondary reporting mechanism. What is the secondary reporting mechanism? Let's just say I'm a Hong Kong-based company and I meet the global threshold of 750 million euros. But Hong Kong tax authorities say, look, you don't need to prepare CBCR, for example. And my Hong Kong-based company has a subsidiary in Australia. Because Hong Kong does not require me to prepare this, even though this is supposed to be prepared by the head office and submitted to the head office tax authorities, if my head office is in a country which does not require this, any other country in the world where I have operations can say, okay, I now nominate the subsidiary in my country as the global head for tax purposes and you now need to report in that other country. Right? So, again, this is supposed to be filed in the country where your headquarters is, but if the country where your headquarters is doesn't have the rules to require you to report this, any other country where you operate can then take the role as quasi-headquarters and require you to report there. So, if I am a country, I don't want another country's tax authorities getting information on a company that's headquartered in my country before even I do. Therefore, there's a motivation for countries to adopt this country-by-country -country reporting. So you can just imagine the amount of work that will need to be done to get this done on an annual basis. You'll probably need uh, you know, top-notch systems to be able to gather this data. Uh, you'll, be able to, you'll need to be able to sift through a lot of data. So for example, when they talk about income tax paid, uh, if you look at the OECD literature, they also want to include withholding tax paid. So if you suffer withholding tax in a foreign country, you have to somehow pull that out and report it in this income tax paid column. And not only do you have to report it on a jurisdiction basis, the next table you have to complete actually requires you to list all the entities you have in each jurisdiction. Uh, and they talk about constituent entities, which include branches, which include taxable permanent establishments. Uh, and they require you then to disclose the activities undertaken by each of those entities. So a lot of information, a lot of detail, a lot of transparency, a lot of ability for the tax authority to find something that may not quite be right. Um, and then, of course, there's a very helpful table three. If you have anything else you want to tell us, please tell us. Um, so basically, based on that, there was a lot of concern about how they would use this information. OECD is saying that countries should not use this CBCR information to make transfer pricing adjustments. It should be for a risk analysis. But of course, whether or not it's truly used as a risk analysis tool or whether countries actually use this to you know, attack taxpayers remains to be seen. So those are you know, the four things I wanted to talk about in relation to base erosion and, and profit shifting. Uh, as you would have seen, some of these things actually already apply. So April this year, some countries are already supposed to start sharing information on uh, tax rulings. And um, so April this year, tax rulings need to be shared. As I said earlier, country by country reporting probably need to report by next year, if not shortly after that. So a lot of these have already come into place. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the law that needs to come into place to enable this reporting is, is now being drafted and put, put in place. Um, so a lot more transparency. But more importantly, uh, even though the OECD has come up with certain benchmarks, uh, some countries have gone above and beyond what the OECD is proposing. So some countries are saying, well, this is really useful. The OECD has told me these are the areas I should look at. And the OECD is saying I should do A, B, and C. But maybe I should expand that. Maybe I should look at D, E, F. Maybe I should not just have transparency between the taxpayer and the tax authority. Maybe I should make this public. So for example, in Australia, uh, on 17th December last year, they actually published on their website the details of the top 1,539 companies in Australia. 
with a turnover of in excess of 100 million Australian dollars in the 2013-2014 financial year. And so you can now go to the website and see the names of the companies, their Australian business registration number, their taxable income in 2013-2014, their turnover, and the tax they paid. Anybody can go there and look at that. So that is probably transparency as its greatest. You and I can now log on with our phones and actually see how much tax this, these companies paid in Australia in 2013 and 2014. And there's a very helpful chart to show that 38% of the companies paid no tax. So naturally, that draws a lot of interest. The media is saying, oh, this is interesting. Maybe we should write a few stories. So transparency is no longer between the company and the, ta the tax authority. It's now the company and the public, the company and its shareholders, the company and the media. So a lot more transparency than perhaps we expected. Uh, and so, you know, with this transparency, you can probably see uh, that BEPS is not just the tax thing. It probably impacts the whole organization. If you need to put into place substance and people and offices to defend your tax strategy, that will involve your human resources group to move people around. It will involve legal, because they'll need to know what sort of entities you need to set up where. It will probably involve public relations. Before you do something, you now have to think, uh, who's going to get hold of this information and what are they going to say? And do I need to prepare my PR people to defend against a, a media attack, a government attack? Right. So it impacts possibly the whole organization. IT is going to be fantastically busy because they're going to have to compile all this information. A lot of this is going to be, have to be automated. You cannot have five people locked in a room 24 hours a day trying to write information on country-by-country country reporting. Systems have to be put in place. So we are going towards a, a brave new era of, of transparency and, and disclosure. Uh, what, what I'd like to do before I finish is perhaps share with you some selected BEPS-related developments, certain things that have taken place to show you that this is not just a fairy tale, it's actually happening. Right. Um, one thing that's, uh, that's happened is there's this document known as the Multilateral Competent Authority Agreement. This actually sets out details on how companies should share country-by-country country reporting information. As at 27 January this year, 79 countries have signed up. Uh, and in fact, on 27 January, 31 countries, including Malaysia, signed that agreement. So now all these countries have said, OK, we are committed to CBCR. We will share with each other CBCR. And they've actually put in place the mechanisms or agreed or discussed the mechanisms on CBCR. So that wonderful collection of tables I talked about earlier are probably going to come in place a lot earlier rather than later. Um, Europe. Uh, so while you know, the OECD has come up with all these rules and guidelines, Europe has probably gone one step further. So in, in March 2015, uh, the European Commission actually came up with their tax transparency package. Under the tax transparency package, they have decided that every company, or sorry, rather every country within the European Commission must share on a quarterly basis all tax rulings and incentives given to companies in their jurisdiction. So if I'm based in the European Commission today and I get an incentive today, within the next quarter that incentive information is going to be shared throughout the European Commission. Every country will know what incentives I have in Switzerland, in Luxembourg, you name it. Uh, and that's far above and beyond what the OECD recommended. The OECD said do it on an annual basis. They said, well, let's do it on a quarterly basis. They were also recommending that not only do I share information going forward, I should also share information on all agreements and all rulings reached within the last 10 years to be shared on the date this comes into place. And with some negotiation that's been reduced, it's now five years, but still a lot of information is going to be shared. So that was in March last year. In July last year, the European Parliament decided that all large companies, all public interest companies within the EU must now disclose this information as notes to financial statements. They must disclose country by country reporting. They must disclose tax rulings in their financial statements. Uh, and that applies to European based companies or public interest entities in Europe. <coughs> and uh, interestingly, uh, in January this year, uh, the European Commission actually looked into a, a whole number of tax regimes and incentive regimes in Europe, uh, and they held that some of these are harmful, meaning they don't have the, de the required degree of substance, and they have said that these should immediately be cancelled. 
Uh, one example is Belgium. Belgium has this thing known as the excess profits tax regime, where if you pay tax in excess of a certain amount, there's a rebate. Uh, the European Commission said that it's not a proper scheme. It is a harmful regime. And not only have they demanded that it be withdrawn going forward, they have asked Belgium to go back a number of years and collect 700 million euros from 35 groups that have enjoyed the benefit in the past. So this transparency is not only impacting people going forward, they are also recommending that you go back and collect past taxes for potentially harmful regimes in the past. So huge, huge implications. So Europe, very, very interesting, taking very strict measures and over measures which are over and beyond what the OECD is recommending. Uh, I'll just now close with one example uh, and in Europe, uh, the UK. The UK is a very interesting regime. They're trying to become more competitive. So the UK tax rate is now only 20%. It's gone down from 28% to 20%, which is very low. It's lower or on par with a lot of countries in Asia. In uh, 2017, they're going to go down to 19%. In 2020, to 18%. So very competitive. The UK has no dividend withholding tax. So if you have a company in the UK, they can pay corporate income tax and all the profits can be remitted after that without any further tax in the UK. The UK generally does not impose capital gains tax on non-residents. So in some ways, very progressive, very investor-friendly, very tax-friendly. On the flip side, um, I talked earlier about how the UK was perhaps one of the pioneers in tax transparency. So they had their disclosure uh, of tax avoidance schemes back in 2004, perhaps before any other country. Uh, and in 2015, the UK, well, this was proposed in 2014, introduced in 2015, the UK has come up with what they call the diverted profits tax regime. What is a diverted profits tax regime? Basically, if you have put in place a scheme or an arrangement which potentially has the impact of diverting profits away from the UK somewhere else, you're meant to disclose that upfront to the UK tax authorities. And this came into place on 1st April. What examples could we look at? So for example, if I have a UK distributor which moves their IP to another country and starts paying license fees. That could be diverted profits because last time the UK company owned the IP and did not pay anybody anything. Now some of the profits are being diverted to another jurisdiction. If a UK company instead of, uh, or uh, a company which wants to do business in the UK, instead of actually setting up a buy and sell trading entity in the UK, instead you just set up a sales support agent and have all the profits captured overseas, that could also be seen to be diverted profits. So there are a whole range of examples. And, and if you feel that something you're doing may result in diverted profits, you are meant to go to the HMRC, the UK Tax Authorities, and report. So the rule is, within, when, when, when you do your first accounting period, after diverted profits tax came into place, within the first six months of the end of the accounting period, you're meant to go to the tax authorities and make a disclosure for the first accounting period. In subsequent accounting periods, the timeline is shortened. It's supposed to be within three months of the, end of the accounting period. So you go to the tax authorities and say, well, I've put in place this structure. It may have resulted in diverted profits, but I think it's robust because of all these reasons. The tax authorities then have two years to look at it. Uh, and within two years, if they feel it's okay, they may not come back. Otherwise, at any time within the two years, they can issue what they call an initial assessment. When you get the initial assessment, you have 30 days to go back to the tax authorities and represent yourself and say, look, even though this is diverted profits, I have transfer pricing documentation, I have substance, there's no reason for you to challenge me. If the authorities agree, fine. Otherwise, they have the ability to issue what they call a charging assessment notice, which you have to pay straight away. And that charging assessment notice will not impose tax at the normal UK tax rate of 20%. It's taxed at 25%. And you need to pay that within one month. You then have one year to come to an agreement with the tax authorities on whether you need to make certain adjustments, uh, perhaps to make them a little bit happier with the whole arrangement. If you can come to an arrangement within 12 months, then you'll just pay 20% corporate tax on whatever you've agreed with the tax authorities to be appropriate profits to be recognized in the UK. And that 25% you paid earlier will be refunded. If you cannot come to an agreement within 12 months, the authorities will keep your 25%. So this requires a huge amount of disclosure because if you don't disclose and they find out, there will be large penalties. Uh, and it also sort of pressures you into perhaps agreeing with the tax authorities because if you don't, 
within a certain period of time, you could be stuck with a 25% tax on a larger base as opposed to a 20% tax on a lower base. So that's just one of the examples of how transparency, substance and disclosure is becoming a lot more prevalent. Um, so going forward, there's going to be a need perhaps to involve a lot more people within the organization before putting in place a structure, a business structure. Uh, it cannot just be tax driven, it has to be business focused and business driven. Uh, and companies have to be prepared for one, a lot more work, a lot more transparency, a lot more reporting. Two, a lot more scrutiny. Three, perhaps a lot more tax challenges and a lot more tax litigation. Uh, and uh, this is probably uh, the, the way the world is going to go going forward. Uh, the tax world one year ago is very, very different from the tax world today. And the tax world in one year is going to be perhaps unrecognizable to somebody today because things are just changing at such a rapid pace. So if you think about it, the OECD started their work on this in 2013. We are now only in 2016 and such rapid changes have already come about. As these things are implemented, I'm sure there will be a lot more changes and a lot more things to be aware of. So I, I'll stop there for now. We'll perhaps have a bit more of a discussion on this in the panel discussion. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you very much for your attention uh, and I'll talk to you again later.